Welcome to this uh, webinar. It's part of a series of webinars uh, sponsored by the Masters of Arts in Climate Action Leadership here at Royal Roads and part of a series of ongoing conversations about climate change, climate action, what we're doing, what we're not doing, and some innovations in the space. Uh, so uh, with me here today are uh, three speakers. Uh, Stefan Woods was going to join us but had something come up so he is unable to join us. Andrew Gage is joining us from West Coast Environmental Law, where he's a staff lawyer and the project lead for its climate change program. Um, under his direction, the program has focused on legal and professional consequences uh, to a range of actors of failing to address climate change. We also have Adrian Carr, City of Vancouver Councillor until the next election, where I'm not sure whether she'll be a councillor or not, but I know um, uh, she's been a, a fantastic advocate for uh, action on climate uh, as a Green Party uh, City Councillor, and uh, she's uh, in her third term. And we also have Abby Lewis, who is a documentary filmmaker, journalist, and educator. He's got a long history of uh, journalism and theatrically focused uh, documentaries, and uh, also ran in the 2021 elections, uh, federal elections, as an NDP candidate. So welcome all speakers. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we'll just go to the next slide. Uh, before we start, as always, I uh, want to uh, give a, a, an acknowledgement of where we live. I was reading recently a critique of land acknowledgements and somehow, um, uh, you know, somehow sort of echoing the, the, the criticism that um, they can be quite empty and sort of a, almost a greenwashing. Um, when we do land acknowledgements, we really want to invite you as well to think about the place mm -hmm. you're in. Uh, we are situated on the unceded uh, territories of the Coast Salish people and specifically the Lekwungen speaking peoples and the Kosamsan ancestors and their families. And it is truly a privilege to be an uninvited guest onto these lands to live and work and play here. And I really want to acknowledge that um, in so doing, we have a lot of work to do to uh, really meaningfully address truth and reconciliation and uh, grapple with the land back movement um, and really look towards uh, Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, Inuit and others um, for their leadership in, in taking action on climate and in protecting the lands and waters that uh, where we live. So Haichka CM and I hope that you'll also acknowledge in your own way where you live, work and play. Uh, this, uh, go to the next slide, please. Uh, so today we'll um, do a short, I'll do a short introduction. We've, uh, we'll speak uh, and hear from each of the presenters in response to questions. There's no formal presentations per se, and engage in a conversation about this, uh, what we anticipate and already has proven to be a controversial topic of uh, suing big oil uh, to support climate action and accountability around climate action. Uh, we don't have far to look, especially living here in British Columbia, but also uh, more recently on the East Coast, uh, about the impacts of climate change on our environment, on our communities and our economy. Uh, the increase in the power of Atlantic storms that we saw with Hurricane Fiona um, really speaks to that. The increase in extreme weather events all over the atmospheric river in 2021 here in southwestern BC and the heat waves and heat domes. These kinds of events are impacting communities, they're taking lives, they're causing enormous suffering and huge damage and economic losses. And they are continuing to grow and escalate in the context of ongoing global heating. Last year, the Insurance Bureau of Canada released a report describing the projected costs of climate impacts. And according to that report's findings, avoiding the worst impacts of climate change at the municipal level so for, for communities that are, that are you know, really grappling with this, it's gonna cost an estimated 5.3 billion with a B per year dollars shared amongst all three orders of government to try and support uh, climate action. Last month, we also saw a report released by the Canadian uh, Climate Institute, a report called Damage Control, Reducing the Costs of Climate Impacts in Canada. And that report described climate change as a macroeconomic risk, risk 
that threatens to undermine future prosperity and that is already resulting in enormous economic losses, as we've just said. Um, their, their report projects that by 2025, we will experience $25 billion in losses relative to a stable climate scenario, that's per year. And that as the impacts and costs of climate change increase, so too are those figures and the job losses that accompany them, productivity losses, uh, premature deaths and uh, negative health outcomes. So, you know, this is to say we're in, we're in a crisis. We all know that the figures, uh, the figures support that, the science supports that. Um, I was just writing uh, a blog about, uh, you know, looking back at a talk I gave in 2015 calling for, you know, many of the things that we're still calling for and really recognizing that we have so far to go, Canada in particular has so far to go to realize targets that we know are important in terms of emissions reduction. So in this context, the Sioux Big Oil campaign was launched in June of this year here in British Columbia. And these four panelists, all or three panelists now um, have much to share with us about what that campaign is about, what, what its organizers hope it will accomplish, how it fits within the larger landscape of climate action initiatives, um, and respond to some of the critiques of it. And there are certainly critiques. So the question at the table, really, around the Subic oil campaign, or one of the questions, is about who pays? Who pays for these impacts? Who pays for the damage that climate change is, is, is causing? So. Um, I'm going to begin with a short welcome asking each of you panelists, the three of you, to briefly introduce yourselves. I introduced you, but you might want to introduce yourselves differently. And I'll begin with Avi and then Andrew uh, and then um, Adrian. Avi? Hi, everyone. Um, Avi Lewis here. I'm coming to you from uh, Huel Kwai, otherwise known as Half Moon Bay, in Shishal territory on the Sunshine Coast. I don't know how much. Uh, biography you want, Robin, I think that you've probably got plenty. Thanks. Adrian. Oh, I'll go Adrian next. Sure. Uh, Adrian Carr, counselor with the city of Vancouver. Uh, I've been a counselor for three terms, running for re-election for my fourth term. Um, and I think some measure of uh, the interest in green politics in Vancouver as I squeaked in in my first uh, try in 2011, and then topped the polls um, in the last two elections. Um, so uh, there is an appetite for, for green politics uh, and for green decision making amongst people who are elected. Um, you asked, I, I think you asked why are, you know, what's your involvement in the campaign? Um, so the Sue Big Oil campaign was launched just a day before this uh, term's final chance to get a motion into council. <laughs> so I was so excited when I, when I read about this, I quickly pulled together a motion um, at the council table and um, uh, it was sort of our last session uh, before the break for summer. And um, that motion passed by a bare six to five vote. Um, but it was really talking to Andrew, learning more about that campaign, the excitement it created um, in terms of uh, wanting to see some solid action, um, especially when the costs are high within the city of Vancouver. Thanks, Adrian. And, and Andrew, what about you? Thanks. Uh, I'm a staff lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law, which is one of Canada's oldest public interest environmental law organizations. And I've been here at this organization for a couple of decades, actually. But certainly for the last um, five or 10 years, worked very actively on climate change. And our, our approach, and certainly my approach, has been that climate change is not uh, you know, a political choice that we can choose to um, uh, address or not, but, but a legal matter, I mean, uh, really the most, one of the most massive violations of uh, human rights, of property rights, of legal rights uh, that the world has ever seen. Uh, and that therefore there are legal consequences to governments, to industry, uh, to professionals who ignore uh, the reality of what they are doing. Uh, and so the, the Sue Big Oil campaign is, uh, you know, West Coast Environmental Law is, is acting as the secretariat for. It's a campaign bringing together a number of organizations and which is supported by thousands of British Columbians looking for local governments to, um, uh, to protect us collectively from the impacts of climate change, uh, both by 
carrying on measures to reduce emissions, by building infrastructure to, that will withstand climate impacts, but also by um, insisting, requiring that those who are most responsible and profit most from selling the products that cause climate change pay their fair share of those costs. Thanks, Andrew. And actually, that's a great segue because I'm, I'm sure, well, many of the people on uh, on the, in this webinar today have heard of Sue Big Oil, obviously um, the title of the webinar, but may or may not know much about what the campaign really is. And there's some, uh, there's a couple of uh, different strategies uh, in sort of in, infused in the campaign. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what the campaign is, what the rationale, you've talked a little bit about that, but what the rationale for it is. And, and yeah, just a little bit more um, meat on the bones of what Sue Big Oil is all about. Sure. Um, so the Sue Big Oil uh, campaign, you, you can look at the website at suebigoil.ca. Um, but basically, we're, we have a short declaration that calls on local governments to, uh, as I said, um, uh, to actually take action to protect their citizens from climate change, but also to set aside $1 per resident towards the cost of them working with other local governments to bring a class action lawsuit against fossil fuel companies for a share of the cost of climate change. Now, I mean, the alternative, the, the reality is right now we are, we are expected to pay all of the costs. Taxpayers are expected and, and communities are expected to pay all of the costs of climate change. And people say, oh, you can't sue fossil fuel companies. We're all responsible for fossil fuel companies. If we are all responsible, sorry, we're all responsible for climate change. If we are all responsible for climate change, that means that fossil fuel companies need to pay a share of those costs as well. Uh, and currently they are not. And in fact, currently they are receiving economic an economic reward for selling products that they know and have known for decades would cause climate change, uh, and yet they expect the public, and we are collective, you know, we collectively all expect the public to pay for all those costs. That's bad economics. That means that those companies have an incentive to do what they've done for decades, which is to actually undermine action on climate change and to keep us hooked on their products, just as the tobacco industry tried to do before until they were sued. So the thinking behind the campaign is, I think, twofold. On the one hand, our communities cannot afford the billions of dollars of costs that climate change is uh, imposing upon us. Um, you know, for taxpayers to do that uh, by, by ourselves with no broader help from, in, from this industry means that we're gonna have to be cutting social services. We're not gonna be able to fund other things that we're going to still uh, see our, uh, the, the impacts um, uh, increase and increase. Uh, and on the other hand is the fact that if we are going to be successful collectively in addressing climate change, we can't have an industry making hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars of profits um, from selling the very products that give rise to it and not taking any responsibility for that. Uh, you know, these are uh, sort of the flip sides of the same coin. But we've had for decades, we've tried to deal with climate change while still having these profits uh, going to the fossil fuel industry and their, sh their shareholders, their investors, the governments that support them. And it's not surprising that with that much money funneled into giving people an economic incentive to find a way, way to keep producing fossil fuels and keep burning fossil fuels, that we've actually completely failed in terms of actually addressing climate change. So the, the campaign really brings that insight together it says, hey, we can sue global fossil fuel companies in Canadian courts because the harm occurs here in Canada. Um, and we can make them begin to reflect some of the, the, the harm they're causing and the risks that they can be held liable on their balance sheets. And that changes how we make business decisions. Well, at the same time, hopefully at the end of the day, getting our communities much needed resources to keep us safe from climate change. Great. So I think that captures it. I want to come back to the, the tax piece of this. But before we go there, we've seen other kinds of class action suits like this uh, against the tobacco industry, pharmaceutical industry, and others. So can you just talk a little bit more about, I mean, there's this idea about what those next steps would be to get to that place. Um, and, and a little bit about that. And also, and this the second part of this, I would open up uh, maybe you can start, Andrew, but to anyone, it's like, what do you anticipate as big oil's uh, likely response based on previous responses, such as the tobacco industry and, and you know, uh, others who have been sued in this manner? So what, what, tell us a bit more about the class action piece, what the next steps are, and then what can we anticipate from this? Yeah, 
Um, I mean, first of all, let me say that being a lawyer, I tend to focus on here's how you would make this work legally. And I really want to emphasize this needs to be a broad social conversation uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, the lawsuits against tobacco were accompanied by massive public debate about tobacco and, the, and its role or lawsuits that ultimately you know, were fought in the civil rights movement or, or um, you know, any social movement. The, the courts, the governments that, that are, are supporting these fossil fuel companies, the companies themselves and their investors need to hear that people expect this industry to pay a fair share of the costs. Um, the, the legal piece of it is important, but it's informed by that broader social context as well. Uh, a class action lawsuit is a lawsuit brought on behalf of lots of people, usually, that are in a similar circumstance. In this case, it's local governments that, that all collectively have to pay more to have higher seawalls or to have bigger um, uh, pipes for stormwater infrastructure or have to do work to uh, manage the wildfire interface area that surrounds them. Uh, to have all of these collective costs uh, related to climate change and local governments uh, have relatively limited options to raise those funds. Uh, and so the idea would be for um, the local governments to each put a dollar per resident towards the costs, uh, to sit down, work together, and hire, hire a legal team that specializes in um, class actions. Uh, and the first step of that is to go to court and ask the uh, judge to confirm that this is a case that should be heard as a class action. Uh, what's exciting about that is the judge has to certify that this is an arguable case, that there is a legal basis for this, and we clearly believe there is, but having a judge make that ruling and say right up front, hey, yeah, this case could be won, uh, and therefore it should proceed as a class action lawsuit, there's, you know, there's more to it than that, but that's, that's part of the test, um, it means that right up at the beginning of the lawsuit, uh, there's a there's a clear ruling that that uh, investors and governments and the companies themselves can take notice of, um, and which will affect their business business decisions going forward. Um, you know the case itself, as I said, it's it's for a share of the cost of climate change. I think that there's sometimes people are like, well, Chevron is not responsible for our all our climate costs. No, of course they're not. Right. Chevron has you know, played a significant role, in, as have Exxon and other companies, in, in delaying action on climate change, and they've benefited substantially from the, the, uh, the profits that they got as a result. Um, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, this, this litigation could be, would be to uh, recover uh, a share based on their contribution to the problem. And Chevron, there's, there's work done by a scientist named Richard Heady that's calculated, who's calculated that um, Chevron's responsible for about 3.2% of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions uh, from their operations and their products. Um, and so the, the case would be to recover that proportionate share um, from each of those companies. Probably going after a relatively small number of companies initially, but once the precedent is set, other companies would have to take that seriously. Uh, governments would probably, um, you know, raise these questions at the international climate negotiations, and we'd have issues. We'd, we'd have um, these issues then uh, coming up there, and hopefully resolved. In uh, I mean, litigation is not. I don't think litigation is anyone's first choice, but it's something you can do under the current law that makes it clear that that you have a legal responsibility if you sell a product that you know causes. Um, these types of impacts uh, and you're profiting from that, that you have responsibility for that product. And, and the science is clear, including the science, uh, their own, the science that has been produced by large uh, oil and gas companies, correct? Mm -hmm. That, you know, that they have known that this is, uh, that emissions uh, are related to uh, global heating. And so there's no question that they're, that they've known this about the product. Yeah. Right. I mean, they've done, certainly by the late 80s, the fossil fuel industry had detailed projections on what types of impacts we'd see right. from climate change. And decades before that, they knew that there were concerns and that there would be significant impacts. Uh, and recently, and you know, there have been, I think now a couple dozen cases along lines of what we're proposing filed in the United States. In one of those cases, a judge asked for a climate tutorial uh, and Chevron and its lawyers came and said, you know, we don't really have a lot to say about this. We agree with everything that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said about this. Our products cause these types of impacts. We agree with that. We don't agree we should be held liable. But but the basic science was uncontested when it when push came to shove in the courtroom. Right. What, so the second, and maybe uh, I asked if you could all talk about the next steps, but I think one of the things that you said sort of leads us directly to you, Adrian. Like this is really a class action 
approach, litigation approach that involves primarily municipalities, correct? And so what, what's, uh, we've talked about the costs, um, but you know, why, what are the current costs, if you know them to Vancouver of uh, preparing for and recovering from these impacts? And what's the motivation for municipalities to join this kind of campaign? Yeah, well, for, first of all, let's not just talk dollar costs. Right. Last summer in the heat dome that hit this province, hundreds of people died, 99 people died in Vancouver. Most of them seniors who just did not have uh, places that they lived in that had any cooling and the heat was extreme. Um, uh, there's a cost in tree canopy. We're losing thousands and thousands of trees within Vancouver, which are a mitigating factor to climate change itself when you cool the city. Um, so when you get to money, um, and when I prepared to my motion in June, um, uh, staff, I asked staff that very question. So thank goodness staff gave me the answer, uh, which is it right now is costing Vancouver about $155 million a year. Um, and that's $50 million a year in adaptation, in other words, repairing um, the damage that's being, that includes repairing the damage that's being caused. Um, things like, you know, the incredible um, uh, heat uh, actually creates a huge problem for the macadamized road surfaces and sidewalks, et cetera. So, and that's something people don't even think about. Um, the big things they think that, that they think about happen to us, which is um, with uh, the incredible heat um, coupled with, um, with uh, sorry, the, the incredible um, uh, storms that occurred in the fall, uh, the atmospheric river um, that came down at flooding has created havoc with our infrastructure in terms of our pipe systems that carry water, sewage, etc. in the city. Uh, lots of flooding um, around that and just, I mean, you come to Vancouver and it's hard to get around anywhere in the city without seeing road crews repairing that stuff even now. Um, and, um, and certainly um, the uh, wind storms um, coupled, which were um, uh, the polar vortex that happened in uh, late last year, just, uh, or late like December to January, um, coupled with high king tides ended up throwing logs onto our seawall, wrecking pieces of the seawall, wrecking uh, waterfront beat, um, pools, uh, which again is causing, you know, a, a huge amount of that cost. But that's just repair. That's just adaptation. Thank goodness as a city, we've also taken on tackling our role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So mitigation um, is about $65 million a year. And when I quote those costs, it's 50, it's um, uh, adaptation 50 million, um, mitigation 65 million. Those are just capital costs. That's just the actual physical infrastructure repair. Operating costs are another 40 million a year. And um, so this is a big chunk of our, of our budget. But as I say, it's not just all about money in my mind, it's about the safety of people, the safety of our environment. So, I mean, obviously, and, and what you've, you've painted a picture for Vancouver, and we know from the evidence around the world, but certainly in Canada, that municipalities are really on the front line of climate impacts. Um, as Andrew said earlier, there are sort of limited strategies for, for municipalities to get money, taxation, and, you know, whatever they get from federal and provincial governments. So what's, this vote passed, you know, pre-election vote passed six to five, I believe. Um, we'll see whether it, it, it moves forward with whatever, whoever the new council is, but what's your sense, your uh, Vancouver participates in the Federation of Municipalities, Canadian Municipalities, and, and works with other municipalities. What's your sense of whether uh, other municipalities are interested in this, uh, likely to come on board, et cetera, as much as you can and tell from your interactions? Okay, well, ask me after, October 15th, <laughs> because uh, we are in, in municipal elections uh, right now. So I'll speak just to the provincial scene first. Um, you probably are all aware that it's been a really tough time um, with COVID in particular. Um, uh, there's been a lot more street encampments, um, the, the drug uh, poison drug crisis, increasing mental health crises. So together with all of that, there is a kind of sense of a swing to the right. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, that's why I say, <laughs> tell, ask me after the, the provincial election, sorry, the, the provinces, municipal elections are, are done uh, this coming Saturday. Um, and just to drive home that point, one of the lead candidates for mayor um, in Vancouver, Ken Sim, who all lost by 970 votes to the current mayor um, in the last election, um, talked about hiring 100 new policemen and was asked by CBC, you know, where are you going to get the money from? The first thing he said was, cut the money for the big oil campaign, uh, Sue Big Oil Pan campaign. So, um, so will municipalities come on board is a, is a really, really, um, I think, uh, up in the air question right now. I can tell you that there are a number of municipalities um, that in uh, British Columbia and across all of Canada um, are very progressive. Um, they are climate oriented. Uh, they have their own coalition and, um, and that climate caucus of uh, municipal leaders is the bright light in all of this. Um, so I was up at the Union of BC Municipalities, sort of the equivalent to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities that you mentioned, of all BC municipalities, and we all got together, had a fantastic time, and um, there are cities, if they get re-elected, leadership at the, in the Kootenays on Vancouver Island, even in, in other uh, northern parts of BC that are interested. Um, the big problem for many of them is municipal governments get what less than 10 cents on the dollar for every tax dollar. So our ability to put money in becomes a very crucial issue um, from, from the, you know, from a, just a wanting to make sure taxpayers are not overburdened point of view. Um, but that's why the, the, the joint action suit, the, the class action suit, I think is so important. Right. And, and I mean, in some ways that is a nice segue to you, Avi, because um, both because um, anything that's going to happen at a large level, as you pointed out, Andrew, really requires uh, a social movement. Uh, it requires more than just municipal elected municipal um, councillors who are responding to their uh, base, to the taxpayers, really. Um, you know, so what, what's it going to take? A, what do you think it's going to take for this to become more of a social movement? Um, and, and is that, you know, is that a good direction or, or what, what's your sense of this? I'm, I'm, I'm just delighted to be in this conversation. I'm, I'm drawn uh, like a moth to the flame to any Sue Big Oil event. And I, I always feel really um, uh, lucky to be involved. Uh, for me, I've been excited about this initiative for many years from precisely that point of view, from a, from a movement, climate movement point of view. Uh, I first became of this, aware of this initiative five or more years ago when Andrew uh, and his colleague at that time, Anjali Apadurai, uh, were working on the first generation of the Subig Oil campaign, which was climate accountability letters, encouraging municipalities to send letters uh, right. to big oil companies and say, hey, you're responsible for this. You've known you're causing damage with the products that you sell. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, I, I mentioned Anjali because I think a lot of people in British Columbia know that she is running a climate movement uh, insurgent bid for the leadership of the BC uh, New Democratic Party. Um, and I think that the climate movement, broadly speaking, because it is a movement of movements, there's indigenous climate action uh, leadership, um, there's uh, grassroots groups, there are mainstream environmental NGOs. The climate movement is a constellation of different forces in society. And it's a diverse social movement in, in that respect. We have an obligation to push uh, on many fronts. And that includes getting involved in the electoral process, whether municipally or provincially or federally. Uh, it includes um, nonpartisan and nonprofit uh, driven campaigns like this one, legal fronts, uh, nonviolent direct action. We've seen people gluing themselves to roadways, to, to, to bank machines, protesting the the, the, the pipeline of, of capital investment in fossil fuels, trillions of dollars since Paris by the largest financial institutions and the big five Canadian banks. So this is about power. This is a battle over power. It's, a, it's an existential fight for the future of all living things. And there is a 
there's a boulder in the road preventing our progress to a safe and healthy future for all of us. And it is the power and the vested interest of the fossil fuel industry and its client class within the political world. And to see governments at every level, provincial, federal, uh, um, especially subsidizing these uh, damaging practices that the science has been clear for decades and we're now seeing the impacts in our daily lives. We must get off fossil fuels immediately in a way that takes care of workers and not these giant extractive corporations, which are profiteering madly and mugging people at the pump right now as we speak. So the, you know, the, the societal, I see this in societal terms. This is a battle for the future. And the Sue Big Oil campaign um, has some incredibly powerful aspects. First of all, it connects us to the, the most accessible level of government, local government. This is where the rubber hits the road, as, as, to use the fossil fuel metaphor, as Adrian knows better than anyone in this call, uh, where 60% of Canada's infrastructure is actually maintained, owned, and managed by municipalities, yeah. um, and where you can get a couple dozen of your friends and go down to City Hall, no matter what community, rural or urban, that you live in, and have a voice much more easily than going to the provincial capital or to the national capital. This is where the water crisis here on the Sunshine Coast, people's gardens have been dying uh, uh, for weeks and weeks and weeks. We're in an unprecedented drought in, in October. There's been no rain essentially since the beginning of September. We've been drier than Arizona, I think, in, in, in the lower mainland uh, for this time. And these are local issues. We're borrowing water from Gibsons and finding new lakes to drain here in the parched Sunshine Coast. And that is a municipal issue. Mm -hmm. Just down the, the coast from me in Half Moon Bay where I live, there's a community hall and a beautiful uh, a boat launch called Cooper's Green. We just spent eight years raising four and a half million dollars in our community from different levels of government and four hundred thousand dollars of it locally to rebuild our ancient community hall and at the last minute when they sent it to geotech for approval they were like you're going to build this thing at sea level how many years do you want it to actually be there mm -hmm. so suddenly on the verge of construction of a vital piece of local infrastructure we are suddenly looking for other sites do we have to put it on stilts so the sue big oil campaign brings the fight against the titanic forces driving us on the road uh, to extinction and collapse down to the local level of local governments where we say, hey, you can step up. You're the ones paying the bill. And there's a, and there's a historic political context to here too. Local governments are the very level of government that have been subject to 40 years of austerity and the retreat of the federal and provincial governments from providing adequate public funding for the essentials of life that guarantee people their human rights. We've downloaded responsibilities while we've uh, withdrawn resources from the front line of government in our lives. And that is the level of government that has to stand up and say, we are gonna speak out against the industry that according to recent research that just came out last month, has made $3 billion a day in pure profit for the last 50 years. The money is there. They are shattering all, all expectations and all historic profit records quarter after quarter after quarter. And, it's, and while they profiteer at the gas pump and while they ram pipelines through indigenous territory and do all of the things that we know that the dirtiest industry on earth does. This is a fight that is in people's lives. And the Sue Big Oil campaign gives us an opportunity to go down and speak to our elected representatives whom we know from our communities, not people in a distant capital and say, hey, a buck a person in our little community, step up and join this collective effort to actually address the existential battle of our time. It's beautiful. It connects the, the micro narrative to, to the macro. And there is a clear path. There's tons of precedent. There are dozens of these lawsuits going on all over the world. And it gives people a way to get organized. And that's where the movement piece comes in. I'll just wrap this first spiel with, with, with this observation because this is what happened to, for us on the Sunshine Coast. There were a group of us, climate activists on the Sunshine Coast that were already organizing. We had a just transitions conversation going on. We um, made a, a beautiful poster, a graphic that had all these uh, solutions for the kinds of things that we see as an intersectional climate justice, safe future for all. And we put them up at farmer's markets and we you know, went uh, door to door and we, we went to community events and we were engaging people in our community on what does a just transition look like in our community? And as we engage with people, and we built our own little hub of activists. We were like, okay, we're ready to move on to a campaign that has a little bit more bite, you know, something with a clear yes, no kind of answer. 
And all of a sudden, Sue Big Oil appeared and we were all of us were like, yes, this is fantastic. So we sat down in a meeting and we made a local, we made a power map of local politicians and groups and influencers that might take our side or be on the other side. So we evaluated the landscape. We identified people who might be with us and called them in. You know, we made spreadsheets and we just, we got resources together. We collected the articles and the evidence. We made documents with tough questions that we anticipated. We organized. And then we started using the petition that West Coast Environmental Law, we did our own little version of it. Now we've got our own website, which you can find in the chat. And we had a launch. When we had our launch uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we had 11 local politicians in this uh, municipal election come to the launch along with 10 times as many people. Um, because everybody in this community understands because we put it on the map that Sue Big Oil is a community effort. It's an activist-driven effort with a legal uh, with a legal point at, at the front edge of it that is really threatening to the most profitable industry on earth. Yeah, and and so this also echoes what you were saying, Andrew. That yes, it is a litigation strategy, but it's also much broader than that. I, what I hear you saying, Abby, is that it was also a point for organizing and a way of bringing people together, uh, supporters and, and, and critics perhaps, but bringing people together around an action that they could take in their own community, in their own level. So Andrew, when you think, because we had conversations and, and you've mentioned this as well, Abby, there are other similar campaigns. I mean, I mentioned tobacco, which is kind of a similar strategy, but there are other similar campaigns. Um, there have been other similar campaigns around this sort of, litigation against um, companies and organizations that are creating uh, or participating in creating the problem. Can you say anything more about that, Andrew, or any of the speakers? Like, what, where does this sit in the landscape of actions globally? Um, I mean, there are, as I mentioned, there are, and as Abby mentioned, there are legal challenges like this going on in, in uh, several countries. You have, most of them are in the U.S., um, but there's also lawsuits in Germany and uh, Switzerland. Um, uh, human rights complaint in the Philippines that's very similar. Um, and uh, most of those, I think, have been more um, legally focused than I think is. You know, there have been campaigns behind some of them, uh, but but uh, especially in the U.S., those cases have been more. Um, uh, lawyer driven. Uh, that's not the intention here. I mean, I think the experience of, with, that Abby mentioned, where we were we were looking for climate accountability letters from um, local governments, you know, we got we had two different dozen municipalities send letters to fossil fuel companies saying, "Hey, we think, that, <laughs> we think that you know we're we're suffering these impacts. You should be paying some of the the costs here." They were by and large ignored by the companies. Uh, you know, there were a couple of responses to a couple of the municipalities, but they were very you know, oh, well, you know, really, we're all responsible for climate change, so you go pay the costs type replies. Um, and, uh, you know, and aren't we good because we're investing a little bit of money in renewables? Um, so the Sue Big Oil campaign, I think, came out of the realization that, that um, you know, Chris, um, we knew that asking nicely was not necessarily going to get us there, but also that um, the local governments needed to hear uh, that their, their constituents um, expected them to take this type of action. Uh, I mean, let's be clear here, the alternative, you know, people say, oh, this isn't uh, the local government's responsibility, some of the local government, the alternative to local government taking action of this type is that local government taxpayers pay all of the costs, right? I mean, it is fiscally irresponsible of governments to say, oh, I've suffered a huge loss, but our taxpayers will just pay for all of it. We won't look to the, the, the companies that have played a lead role in causing that to pay any of it. Um, so your connection is is uh, somewhat new, yeah. and and uh, I, I really want to definitely a call out to the Sunshine Coast uh, uh, Sioux Big Oil campaign that that is further along than I think any other community of the province has yet, um, in really showing what that can look like at the grassroots level. Um, uh, you know, so I, I yeah. There are examples of of this conversation happening. I mean, the, the there were seven thousand people who signed up to the Friends of the Earth Netherlands lawsuit against Shell. Uh, German Watch in in uh, Germany is has, has been so supporting a Peruvian farmer in his lawsuit against the German coal company RWE. Um, 
but in terms of pressing to protect us in this way and to actually recover the costs, uh, I think that this is something new and that uh, we should be, we can be proud that that uh, BC communities are on the and the people organizing here are on the forefront of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Adrian. Yeah, if I could, if I could just add to that, um, I think that uh, it is incredibly prudent from a financial management point of view uh, to seek um, the damages, the cost of the damages from those who created them. It's like the polluter pay principle. I think everybody kind of gets that. And this is it. This is a grand polluter pay problem. And um, so, uh, you know, I try and approach it from that sort of fiscal point of view. I'm doing due diligence as a counselor, trying to get back money for the citizens who have through their taxes paid this amount out and are continuing and will only increase to pay larger um, amounts out um, to cope with damages that they haven't created or caused. Now, I do have a kind of counter question I want to pose to Abby and Andrew. And um, so here I am on the campaign trail. I'm out canvassing, talking to people morning, noon or night. And a common question is not that many people, but a common question that has come up is, well, look, aren't we all complicit? Don't we, mm -hmm. haven't we driven our cars? Mm -hmm. Haven't we enjoyed the fruits of fossil fuels in terms of the economy and the machinery and the everything else? And mm -hmm. so therefore, how can we expect them to cover the cost when we have been complicit in this whole use of oil? How do you respond to that? It's such a big one, hey? Um, Andrew, you, you go ahead, because I, I, I mean, I think we've all, we've all struggled well, with this. I, I think the simple answer is, uh, if we are all responsible for climate change, that means the oil and gas industry is also partly responsible for climate change. I mean, it's a really right elegant now, answer. <laughs> we are paying 100% of the costs, uh, and this industry is paying nothing. I mean, you're paying tax dollar, dollars to whatever government they happen to be situated in, but they're, they're, it's not based on their contribution to the problem. It's based on, um, you know, so, so we are... We're seeing an industry that, um, that you know, yes, we've, we're complicit in the same way that smokers were complicit. Um, doesn't mean that the industry that um, sold the product, made the profits, knew that their product was going to cause those impacts and actually lobbied against action should pay nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the question that we should, the conversation we should be having is what is their fair share? Right. Um, not, you know, sh should we, should they pay anything? Uh, and, and to me, it's bizarre that people think it's okay to, to respond to the idea that they should pay something by saying, oh, but we're all responsible for climate change. You know, that's, that's, that's having bought the industry Kool-Aid. I mean, you, if you, we don't say, um, you know, the tobacco company aren't the ones who actually smoke the cigarettes, so they shouldn't pay anything. <laughs> it's really true. And this, this is actually, Adrian, this, this sort of talking point that you're hearing, um, at one and the same time, it is true. Fossil fuels are an unbelievable source of compacted energy, mm. which uh, has driven the development of capitalism from the steam engine on. And there's no question that we have created, uh, humans have created a system that has relied on fossil fuels um, and they have fueled, they've kept our lights on and they have uh, created an immense uh, prosperity. Prosperity that is not equally shared. Um, the uh, countries of the global south are uh, experiencing mm -hmm. much more dramatic effects from the climate emergency, uh, and they are responsible for causing a, a fraction of it. So when, when we start talking about fair shares, I'm excited about that conversation, because I also want to talk about what we as Canadians owe to the rest of the world and what the global north or owes to the global south. But apart from the reality that fossil fuels have built our modern world, the, the, the fact is that that thing about, well, you had a soft drink from a plastic straw once, therefore you're not allowed to say anything about uh, climate change uh, or fossil fuels, is one of the first and best funded fossil fuel misinformation, counterinformation wow. talking points. And there are books and studies and new ones coming out all the time. Jeff Dembecki has a new book coming out about uh, the history of decades and millions and tens of millions of dollars uh, uh, that the fossil fuel industry has spent uh, uh, putting its finger on the sore spots of people's own feeling of guilt and complicity. And I want to say something else about this too. The, the sort of climate movement 1.0, the first generation of, of big ENGO-led climate action 
really focused on changing light bulbs. I mean, when you think about it from the light of 2022 and the 600 precious lives that were lost in the heat dome and the catastrophic impacts in Pakistan where mm -hmm. 33 million people were affected by, and, and a third of that country is still affected and much of it is still underwater, right? They're in a drowned world in an important country on earth, Pakistan right now. So when we think about it, we were asking people to change their light bulbs. Mm -hmm. We were saying lessen your carbon footprint the environmental movement, not now, but but uh, two decades ago, does bear some responsibility for this, and I will just say it in ideological terms, for a very neoliberal idea of individual responsibility, that somehow we as individuals, all solutions have to be me as a taxpayer, what can I do as an individual? Mm -hmm. It is a collective and systemic problem that we've built mm -hmm. our society on these sources of energy, and it is a collective and systemic response that's required. We have to come together and listen to the science and listen to what indigenous uh, knowledge has been trying to communicate to us uh, for, for generations now and actually build a society based on a different set of values around health of people and health of planet. And there's plenty of prosperity to go around uh, in, in, in that next economy that we need to build. We just know that we can't do it on fossil fuels anymore. And now that the technological uh, advances have been so significant and particularly China, uh, over subsidizing the, the production of inputs for solar and wind uh, energy for 30 years now has brought down the price of, ultra, of renewable energy uh, by like 90%. And so the business case for energy, new energy uh, generation on planet Earth right now favors renewables massively. The question is, and why, what, how can I speak out because I use fossil fuels in a world designed for and by fossil fuels? The question is, why aren't we moving? Why aren't we moving to renewables in a massive way? Why aren't we decarbonizing what we've known for so long uh, uh, and the solutions are so readily available? And the reason is the power of the fossil fuel industry and the Sue Big Oil campaign, the fossil fuel industry, which had its own secret committee with the cabinet of Canada during the pandemic, which has unprecedented access to politicians at every level which lobbies more effectively and more relentlessly than any other industry. They have captured the institutions of our democracy and our political class. And that is why we're not getting off fossil fuels. The, the research that Robin Allen did that came out last week, that the, that the Trans Mountain Pipeline is, go, is, is structured with shell corporations that are going to dump $17 billion of its debt on the public purse, we are spending fortunes not getting off fossil fuels. Just stopping banging our head against the wall will feel so good when we finally do it. And the well, Super Oil campaign is a way of crystallizing it for people. Right. Name and, and, and I think the other, you know, this this shift from you know individual responsibility, which still exists, but is absolutely insufficient and as you say has been promoted as a way as opposed to looking at these collective movements. Another critique of this Sue Big Oil um, that I've heard um, and I'm sure that you have as well is around the impact on jobs. And this is the critique always of shifting away from fossil fuels, job loss and, and economic losses. So, um, you know, I just open that up for anyone that wants to respond to that piece of, of you know, when, when people are looking at, you um, the shift and saying, right, but we're going to lose jobs. There's a beautiful report called The Big Cleanup that came out of an Alberta-based group uh, a couple of years ago. I know Vivian's going to find it and put it in the, uh, in the chat. They actually crunched the numbers on what would happen if the polluter paid in Alberta to clean up the abandoned oil and gas wells that are like ticking time bombs in communities. And the conventional oil and gas industry has evaded its responsibility, its legal responsibility to clean up its mess there for decades with compliant governments. If the fossil fuel industry was actually held to the letter of the existing law and had to remediate those well sites, hundreds of thousands of, 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 of leaking and dangerous well sites just in the province of Alberta where most of the fossil fuel jobs are, so it's right to concentrate there, they could create something like 25,000 jobs a year for decades and billions of dollars in economic activity, putting all of those oil and gas workers and all of their specialty to work remediating the sites that they have been uh, using to extract. And that is a massive economic opportunity to create job for generations 
with those specialized skills of drilling and 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 rig maintenance and all of the uh, the electrical and all of the uh, pipe fitting and all the rest of it, uh, forget renewable energy just for a second. There is a huge economic driver in restoring that beautiful province of Alberta to its original state in all of those places where the oil and gas wells are literally time bombs in people's fields and backyards. And all that would be required is government actually standing up to big oil and requiring them to fulfill the law that is the law of the land right now that polluters have to pay and take some of these profits back and reinvest them in creating generations of jobs in that province with that very same workforce. So the, 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 the solutions are everywhere. That's just one of them. So wait, and we know. Sorry, Sorry. Andrew. Okay, I'll go. Um, So I I totally agree in terms of of the cleanup, but the opportunity in terms of green jobs, you know, and people really talked about that a lot um, throughout the the pandemic. And um, because there was such a loss of jobs at that time. So there was a lot of interest in, you know, where is our economy heading? What kinds of jobs do people, people want jobs that they feel are contributing to a healthier environment, to mitigating climate change, uh, to providing resilience um, and quality of life. Um, And amongst those jobs, a lot of talk happened in Vancouver around renewable energy and retrofitting. So reducing GHGs um, by retrofitting buildings. I mean, 58% of Vancouver's greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings, which largely are heated by gas. Um, uh, But they are inefficient. And so retrofitting is, um, is, is a really big thing. But it's really hard to get trades people. I mean, at, at, at the very beginning, people said, okay, we'll, we'll do some home rentals during this COVID period. Um, and the wait list for putting a heat pump in a home in Vancouver uh, was like eight months. Um, so, I mean, I've just put motions forward to the Union of BC Municipalities. We just had meetings last two, or two weeks ago. Uh, they passed unanimously um, to get the provincial government to back um, the call for more training of skilled labor um, in the field of renewable energy, in, you know, you know, in, in British Columbia province wide. Um, it's also so important from a resilience point of view. Um, BC Hydro, for example, has already released its a report um, in terms of projected supply and demand and is saying clearly by 2030, it says only until 2030 can it project even with Site C Dam that it has enough hydroelectricity to be able to supply to the level of demand that they anticipate at that time. And we have to go to, to green energy, renewable energy sourced electricity as that transition off fossil fuels. So um, for me, I really see, um, and by the way, BC Hydro, you know, talked about who is holding back development of renewable energies, et cetera. BC Hydro itself is complicit in that. I mean, they are not providing the feed-in tariffs um, that are needed to entice uh, people to actually generate their own electricity by putting solar PVC on, on their roofs or for First Nations who are very much involved in wanting to develop solar farms and wind farms, uh, geo exchange, geothermal um, energy production. And they're just not getting any kind of rates um, that are feasible to allow them to do that. Instead, BC Hydro's buying sort of uh, spot price uh, energy from the United States instead of investing in this province in renewable energy infrastructure, which provides for that safe um, uh, future. So um, I, you know, I think that there's a lot around jobs. It's a great question, Robin. That it's not about we're going to lose jobs. I think the opportunity as Abby's already pointed out, to create them, um, not just in repair, but in a renewable energy economy is phenomenal. We just need our institutions at all levels of government to get on board with that. Let me just, can I just, can I just put a quick footnote on heat exchanges? Because it's so exciting, like what could happen? We know anecdotally that people want to switch off of fossil fuel heating to heat exchanges, and nobody can get one. And this is why the case for public ownership is so important. We have an opportunity in British Columbia to create an entire manufacturing industry and a a, a massive wartime level of of training to scale up an entire workforce to put heat exchanges in every building in this province. And if the market won't do it, 
like in the Second World War, as Seth Klein's book, The Good, A Good War, uh, pointed out with, with such ex incredible historical references, the government has to step up and just do it. But we could yeah. be creating jobs, good union jobs in manufacturing. We could be training an entire army of heat exchange installation. And, yeah. and all of that goes into people's bottom lines in their homes because they're going to save a ton of money on heating. Yeah. And it's a public good. And we could get off fossil fuels and buildings yeah. in yeah. very short order if we took it to scale. But yeah. it, if, if the market's not going to do it, that's what public ownership is so for. So why is it that the federal government um, and the provincial government have backed off initiatives that they actually started? So I mean, think you know that, that my husband and I have a place on the Sunshine Coast. We built there 36 years ago. Um, I think it was the first passive solar house on the coast, not certified because it wasn't a certified process back then. Um, so at that time, the federal government was subsidizing by 50% the cost mm -hmm. of putting solar hot water on the roof. We have had solar hot water tanks there. We get free hot water for six months. Unlimited. Of call it, yeah. Right. And yeah. it preheats it for the rest of the year. Um, but they they dropped those subsidies and the and the solar hot water business went out of business in Canada. So I don't understand why we had forward looking policies that then were dropped. I mean, when you look at these specifics, and this is, again, to bring it back to Sue Big Oil, this, you know, who lobbies against all of those subsidies? Who lobbies against the consumer programs? Who lobbies against the public investment in renewable energies? It is the oil and gas industry. Yeah. And, 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 and they have successfully extracted a lot of money from our governments that so, needed to go to other things. So, I mean, in, in this, uh, around the oil companies, around... Uh, this shift to renewable around job creation, there's there's a discourse that is being controlled or informed by parties with power. This was a point that you made early on, Andrew. So I just want to open up an opportunity for you to talk, uh, either to respond to the job question, but also this larger question of um, how we shift the discourse from, um, from these interest groups uh, driving conversations about jobs, job loss, driving changes to uh, government support in terms of uh, green energy or, or you know, what, what, whatever it is. I don't know if you've got some thoughts that you want to share on that, Andrew. Well, I'm, I'm, on the jobs thing, I agree with everything that's said, but I think that that's a, a problem that's related to the climate movement generally and not a, not a criticism of so big oil. Uh, um, uh, one of the one of the other things I, I sometimes hear as a critique of Sue Big Oil is like, oh, you're just vilifying the industry. Yes, they did some bad things by like you know delaying us for action on climate change for decades, but that's water under the bridge. Um, and the fact is that it, it's not water under the bridge. That as long as you have an industry that's making, as I said, hundreds of billions of profits and expecting the public to pay for for the costs. Um, they're going to act that way. And they, they continue to act that way, as Abby's highlighted with the law, lobbying. Uh, and they, it's not just that they act that way. And they, they do. They clearly have a huge impact on public policy, obviously. Um, but they also are seen um, by investors, by governments, I think by the general public, as being profitable job creators, uh, instead of being recognized as the, um, the climate debtors that they actually are. Um, and so, you know, the point of, of Sue Big Oil, and here I'm taking using it broadly, not necessarily the class action, but the public conversation that, has, that we need to have happen is to actually, you know, reframe an industry that claims to be responsible while it completely shirks its responsibility for anything it causes. Um, you, you know, the, the, the problems you're talking about, about the transition, yes, it's partly power, but it's partly the public perception uh, resulting from a system that, that is, um, I mean, you know, from an economic term, you talk about it as externalities. It's, it's got a, a, a complete, you know, get out of jail free card on paying any of the externalities associated with it. And so, you know, one campaign is not going to do everything, of course, but the point of the Sue Big Oil campaign, um, and as I say, especially in relation to the, the social organizing around, around it, is to really directly challenge that that assumption that this industry is actually profitable uh, and by by highlighting the huge cost that they are imposing on the rest of us. Um, well, much that's less, the, only answers yeah. your question, but it, it helps uh, you know to to see how we can move forward when we um, when we directly you know challenge government subsidizing this stuff because they think they get money back out of it. Um, and the public thinks they get money and jobs back out of it. 
uh, whereas actually it is ultimately an industry that is destroying an awful lot of jobs, certainly the livelihoods of people out there, um, and which is paying none of the costs. And if that's incorporated into the cost, they, they begin to look much less like a good investment. A couple of major developments just on, on that, two more footnotes for, for the chat. There was um, uh, an analysis done about the corporate tax cuts in Alberta uh, that the oil and gas industry was given in order to create jobs and they actually used them to automate and further reduce their workforce. And the question of whether Subig Oil, uh, uh, the, that the crimes of misinformation and disinformation are water under the bridge, we're in a period of epic, epic greenwashing right now. And if you look at the Pathways Alliance, the major uh, tar sands producers who have banded together in this massive greenwashing uh, exercise to say that they'll be that the tar sands will be net zero by 2050. First of all, it gives you a little window into the uh, terrible uh, uh, lie that net zero pledges actually uh, amount to, because they plan to produce more and more and more uh, bitumen to 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 pipe and be burned elsewhere, just not counted in our national inventory. So it's not ze net zero is not zero, but they've been they're they're working the government for more subsidies for carbon capture and storage, and despite the billions that they've made, a Pembina report just from the last month pointed out that they are allocating just about zero to their net zero pledges right now, the big companies uh, uh, extracting bitumen in Alberta. They are making these pledges. They are, they are putting a lot of money into marketing their environmental uh, and climate commitments. They are not making any of the capital commitments that would allow them to fulfill even their uh, hypocritical commitments to net zero because they maintain they're gonna produce more oil and export more oil uh, while they reduce their emissions. And they aren't making any of those investments anyway. So the notion that this is something that was in the past, that is kind of a black and white memory of the cigarette advertising, you know, Exxon style, it's happening right now. And it's oh. happening in a massive way. And, and Mark Carney's $130 trillion coalition of financial institutions that he gathered in Glasgow to make net zero uh, commitments, the same. Those financial institutions in Canada, in, in Canada, the big five banks and globally, uh, all of the biggest banks in the world have invested trillions of dollars in fossil fuel projects since they committed uh, uh, to the Paris Accords and, and, and they've many, most of them have signed on to this global Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero. So we've got, it's all still happening. The thing that's changed is the discourse. The practices have been uninterrupted and that requires calling out and, and chipping away at the social license of these companies to keep lying to us because it's not it's not okay and people and it confuses people they they have good marketing uh, departments they put out good propaganda and it, and it confuses the issue and that's why they do it well you know there's this intersection between what you're describing uh about you know big oil companies um not living up to their commitments um with this idea of Sue Big Oil and trying to call for some accountability in that regard. And how does that fit within, uh, I, I realize it's a municipal government kind of focused strategy, but how does that fit within the larger picture of Canada's commitments and, and um, lack of action on those commitments, really, uh, lack of substantive action on those commitments? We're still the, I mean, we're the 10th, uh, biggest emitter, but really by virtue of population size, either first or second in the world, uh, polluter. And so as we head into COP27, Sharm el Sheikh, and we have a federal government going there to uh, release the national adaptation strategy and to uh, celebrate um, whatever actions we've taken, where does the Sue Big Oil um, campaign fit within that thing? I mean, is it going to move federal governments forward? Are they going to fight this? Um, what, should, what are your thoughts on that? Because this is part of a larger issue around the discourse and the misinformation and disinformation and the lack of action on targets, whether they're set aggressively or not. I mean, to me, I, I think, um, the Sue Big Oil campaign has, as I mentioned earlier, you, we can sue global companies for their the harm they cause in can, uh, Canada. So we can sue Exxon for its global emissions, Chevron for its global emissions. And that means that we're not sort of locked into what can we get Canada to do. Uh, and in fact, we're actually trying to create a global price signal. We're, we're trying to create a, a price signal that, that affects all governments that are propping up uh, oil and gas companies. Um, 
the the campaign you know there's been some debate in the campaign about whether or not the lawsuit should include canadian companies or not i mean the the canadian companies obviously are significant but they don't fall within the top 10 or even 20 um fossil fuel companies in terms of their their contribution to climate change um the, some of the comp you know international companies have subsidiaries here that that would be caught up in it um you know imperial oil for example is an exxon subsidiary um but you know, so I think it, you know the the broad social narrative does change things. In terms of the price signal we're trying to send through the litigation, um, uh, it's it hopefully eventually changes how the industry is perceived. But the lawsuit itself, it depends which municipalities, the local government, sorry, which which what the municipalities decide to to include as their defendants, whether Canadian companies ultimately are directly caught up in it. Um, as the campaign grows, presumably we will see calls for provincial and federal governments to also initiate this type of litigation. Um, the uh, you know, the fact is that taxpayers at those levels of government are also being uh, are, are having to pay the full costs of climate change. I mean, province of BC has spent billions, ten, hundreds of billions of dollars fighting wildfires, and they are directly tied to climate change, dealing with flooding. That's directly tied to climate change, uh, dealing with the heat dome. Um, and uh, you know, so those same same issues arise there. Um, but I think our hope is that as the conversation grows, that we'll, we'll there'll be more opportunities to actually uh, influence those other levels of government. I don't see the campaign as as directly influencing the climate negotiations so much as creating new incentives for industry and governments to support them at all levels to um, to take to make different business decisions about what they support and what they're looking for. And you certainly could see scenarios where a future government, uh, either in Canada or elsewhere, says, hang on, we don't like the idea of this litigation. We want to um, actually go to the climate negotiations and uh, you know, put a you know, ban, ban or restrict these types of uh, lawsuits. That type of, of shift in negotiating is actually how we got international funds related to oil spills. Is The threat of litigation uh, resulted in it, government saying, oh, we need to protect the oil companies. Let's have the oil companies play, pay directly into an international fund for to, to clean up oil spills. Um, you know that's not necessarily a bad scenario as long as the the what's negotiated in the international agreements is ultimately robust enough. But that's some years away. I think I don't think that we're um, uh, you know that the, there's enough uh, clearness that these companies will sooner or later be held liable under uh, the litigation uh, that we're going to see governments doing that just yet. Can I ask a question, Robin, um, of Andrew uh, on this theme? Um, that is that um, uh, I, I noticed that uh, Lisa Helps, um, current mayor of Victoria, commented on the Subic oil campaigns and said that she preferred to see um, pro a provincial government initiative on this. Um, so if, if a, a jurisdiction like the province of BC is actually subsidizing and has been subsidizing the oil and gas industry, such as the fracking in the north of, northeast of BC, does that make, does that kind of take them out of the picture for being able to then sue big oil? Like if they've been subsidizing oil expansion, oil and gas expansion? Well, I mean, I think that goes to some of the questions about how we view the industry and why the government's view it as prof profitable and why we give subsidies to industry. And clearly, the BC government should not be subsidizing the oil and gas industry, right. and we should be putting the money towards these other costs. But I don't think it necessarily disqualifies future governments from um, uh, from taking action to hold fossil fuel companies accountable. I mean, governments took receive taxes from the sale of, uh, of tobacco, um, and certainly up. Uh, uh, we don't have a tobacco uh, uh, agricultural crop here, but other governments did subsidize uh, that in other uh, jurisdictions, and and uh, that wasn't a barrier to to those um, states uh, recovering costs. Oh, so okay. I don't think it's it's necessarily a fatal barrier, but it's there is an inconsistency there that governments need to address. Mm. I, I we do have got we've got a lot of of questions at the local level here on the Sunshine Coast Soupy Oil uh, crew about why aren't we targeting the governments with lawsuits because you know and there and there are lawsuits going on uh, against governments in Canada like the, yeah. the young folks who are suing uh, the government from, from Ontario um I think that's a federal suit right Andrew the youth uh, climate suit the Ontario, there's one in Ontario against the Ontario government and there's um right. there are at least two nationally against the three this one of them was unsuccessful yeah. so there, there were three nationally against the federal government I mean just I on think that, that it, yeah, it's I mean we're we're you know if you sue Canada, you're talking about Canada's 
5%, 1.6% of global emissions. If you sue Chevron, you're talking about Chevron's 3.2% historically of global emissions. Uh, and if you're suing multiple of the global companies, you can actually have a much larger impact. So we, the Sue Big Oil campaign is ultimately about going after that profit motive, the separation of the costs of the fossil fuel economy from the benefits of the fossil fuel economy and bringing them together. Uh, you know, the, the lawsuits, I'm very supportive of the lawsuits saying, hey, our government needs to do more to protect us. But ultimately, it still leaves intact that the huge profits that have been undermining democratic discussion about about climate change. Right, um, right. So it's a, they're two different tools. Um, and we think that the Subic Oil tool, the litigation against the companies is an absolutely critical one. It's also fiendishly clever in the way that it um, it makes use of some particularities of BC law, um, and this is something that 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 I think local politicians always kind of sit up and take notice when when we explain that under BC law, if there's a class action suit of municipalities and the judgment goes against us and uh, they can't be forced to pay the costs or damages uh, uh, against uh, against the big oil companies if we lose. So there's there's the legal costs will be substantial over to, over time, uh, but there's no uh, uh, financial jeopardy here uh, in BC for local governments. And we do have the capacity to sue these global players from British Columbia, which is not available in, in every jurisdiction and is, is a really important, um, uh, I, Andrew, I see you flinch, but maybe that's because you need to make the case. Right. No, no. I think we can sue sue any global players can be sued pretty much anywhere in Canada. In the U.S., they cannot. So that's true. Right. Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But elsewhere in Canada. But you're right about the class proceedings act that, that elsewhere in Canada, if you lost, you might have to pay a, a portion of the other of the fossil fuel companies' legal uh, fees um, for if it's called adverse costs. Whereas in BC, that's not the case. So that that is unique to BC. It comes to the fiscal prudence argument at the local government level, which is which is really important to underline. But also, just like let's look at where people are at right now. I mean, and go, and, and the climate conversation in Sharm El Sheikh. First of all, a climate summit that's taking place in a police state when there are some sixty thousand political prisoners who are many of them are climate activists uh, and many of them are figures from the uh, Egyptian Revolution who can't take part in civil society is a greenwashing exercise for. A brutal regime that that uh, I think the climate movement has to look hard in the mirror before validating this current COP in Sharm El Sheikh. Um, but where people are at in the communities where we live is that if people are panicking, the price of everything is going through the roof. We're on the verge of a of, of a global recession, which is being uh, uh, exacerbated by central banks driving up the, the cost of borrowing money in a way uh, that is based on faulty old logic and is, is going to make the problem worse, not better. So people are panicking about money right now, mm -hmm. and and at the same time they're they're seeing these profits uh, in in multinational oil co corporations, and they're seeing what they pay to fill up their car. And there's just a populist moment here where the juxtapositions of this system are just are, are popping out at people. Mm. And as 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 people who care about uh, about climate action, I think we have a responsibility to connect the dots for people. And right now it's a simple follow the money argument um, that speaks right to the cost of living crisis that Canadians are going through everywhere and allows us to go around a lot of these traditional narratives, also many of them funded by the fossil fuel industry, like you, like the other one you were talking about, Adrian, which is that people who are just working hard to get their get food on the table and get their kids to school don't have time to care about climate change. People who are taking their kids to school if they don't have an electric vehicle are paying through the nose to these companies that are shattering profit records with a product that is burning our planet. And people are not stupid. They know what's going on. This is a huge opportunity to focus the debate on following the money and there's never been a moment like this. When oil prices are $10 a barrel, it is a lot harder to make this case. When oil prices are high and oil profits are shattering records is precisely the moment when we have to highlight that with the boom and bust cycles, over time, they've made $3 billion a day for 50 years. They have profited to an eye-watering extent. And people are angry about elites who are extracting uh, from from a system that benefits them, while people find it increasingly hard to buy groceries, and we have to connect the dots because it is it is about the future of our lives together. So, if 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 with the other side of the campaign, where the campaign itself or the litigation is is at least partially funded by taxpayers, a dollar a dollar ahead 
uh, you know, taxpayers. What's the argument for taxpayers who are also who are also in the midst of, of this, uh, you know, increasing prices and looking at social services eroding, et cetera, going, a dollar may not be much, but that dollar could go to something else to fight yeah. homelessness. So what, what would you say, what would any of you say to taxpayers? Because ultimately taxpayers are, as you say, paying for the impacts, but they're also being asked now to, to you know, agree with only a dollar, but a dollar ahead going towards this. Yeah. You well, must have got that as a doorstep, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, no, I, I, I get that question. Okay. But, you know, yeah. but I, I have to say when I tabled the motion, um, I was really interested to see what the response would be back. So I got about 120 emails saying, good on you, like this is fabulous. And 10 saying, what are you doing? Like wasting our money to do this stupid case that will never win. Um, the point is, there's a chance to win. And the chance to win means a chance to recoup a lot of taxpayers' money that's being spent on this. And it's fair for the companies to pay a share of the damage they've caused that we are paying for. Um, so there's a logic to it that if you explain to people, they go, oh, okay, I get that logic. But those are the, there are those, there's a small percentage who are absolutely adamantly um, opposed to something like this. And I mean, they're, they're you know, they're right on the political spectrum and you're not going to convince them. So I don't try. Um, I just listen and say, yeah, you're, you're welcome to your opinion, but you know, I'm doing this I mean, and I have a lot of support for it. We have pulled on this. And, and I mean, again, it depends partly, people have to understand that fair share part of the, of the equation or, or the answer is very different. But if they understand you're looking for a fair share and that, that otherwise taxpayers are paying the, the cost, um, we had 38% strongly support the idea of local governments suing fossil fuel companies. This is a poll um, that Stratcom did. Um, and another 30% who somewhat support. So a total of 68%. Wow. Um, and that was fairly, actually, surprisingly constant across the political spectrum. Uh, I mean, there was obviously higher support among sort of more progressive, you know, left, left you know, green NDP um, voters, but still... Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50% either strongly or somewhat support among um, liberal and conservative party voters. Uh, so um, it's, you know, people understand this as, as once they understand that you're not saying, oh, Chevron's all to blame or they should be paying everything. We should, shouldn't be paying anything. You know, we're blameless. They're the ones that fought, fault. If people understand you're talking about, you know, hang on, they're not paying anything. They need to pay a share of this. Uh, there is actually very high high support, and it is across the political spectrum. Yeah. Can I just add uh, one other thing that you'll be interested in? Do you know who comes up to me? And I, as I say, hundreds of conversations a day. Who comes up to me, kind of the most adamantly supportive of sort of tackling climate change, including Sue Big Oil? People who come from other countries not just even recent immigrants, but you know, longer term immigrants, people whose families are in India, in Pakistan, in the Mideast, who are up in the Philippines. They, they are absolutely terrified for the impacts climate change is having on their home countries. And um, so that's that's one big group that maybe you hadn't realized, but I, I in this campaign, it's been really brought home to me how concerned they are. And the other group, youth. Yeah. Uh, count on youth for having a clear head about the future that they don't see as being a good one in their lives. I mean, it breaks my heart at council when I have young people coming, speaking to emotion, and they say, you know, I've decided I'm not gonna have children because yeah. I just don't see a future for children on this planet. So um, there's there's a lot of support. Um, I would say that the you know West Side single family homeowners are not the biggest support group on this, um, but uh, but there is a lot of support and it's very diverse. There's a, there's something too about the actual costs of our current system that I I don't think they've been communicated clearly. When I hear that insurance industry estimate of five billion dollars a year. Um, I, I, I always kind of wince at that, like that, that that's just such a, a massive uh, understatement 
of, mm -hmm. of the cost that we face. The, the simple truth, and any climate scientist will tell you this, is that our entire modern industrial society has been built for a climate that no longer exists. Right. right. And so the truth is that we have to reinvent all of our systems. Mm -hmm. And this is where the, you know, the one point, the IPCC uh, report on one point, the importance of 1.5 degrees um, in, in 2018, you know, really drew a line under it. We need transformative systems level change in all aspects of society, is what they said. We need to reinvent how we get around, how we grow our food, where and how we work and live and the buildings and infrastructure all has to change. Those costs uh, are beyond uh, description. They are within our capacity, but they're not gonna be counted in the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And they are coming whether we like it or not. So we can either pay them in repairing old infrastructure in the old ways to have it break again and repair it again next year, like the TMX pipeline uh, and and the bridges that it ran under in in the atmospheric river, where you know they had to stop work on the pipeline and try to, to try to rebuild the infrastructure around it, so they could continue building the pipeline, which in the next uh, massive flooding in that region will wash out again, right? Or we can actually start building the 21st century infrastructure that we need. And I just want to bring people back as we think about the cost of a dollar per voter in a regional district or in a city. A council and a, and a municipality bring people back to that institute, the Canadian Climate Institute uh, damage control report, which talked um, really uh, stirringly about the losses that are already happening uh, in economic activity. So, you know, they're saying that in 2025, Canada will experience $25 billion in losses relative to a stable climate scenario, which we are not in. Um, and uh, up to 50% of projected 2025 GDP growth. So we're talking about less than three years from now, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars of foregone GDP growth. Now, I don't agree with all of the assumptions in these kinds of calculations, but the scale of what we're talking about and needing to reinvest in the bones of our society is, is real. And the costs of not doing anything, they may have been pushed out of view or they may have been written out of the story, but we have an obligation as climate communicators in all of our different spheres to start talking about the costs of the status quo in a way that is really compelling for people because it is counted in dollars and huge numbers of dollars beside which a dollar per person in, in Gibsons or in Vancouver or Victoria is nothing, uh, is a tiny little bet on a safer future. Whereas the vast, coffers of these corporations are betting on a disastrous future. And we have to start placing these counter bets because we've seen the transformative effect that lawsuits can have. And tobacco, uh, it's not a perfect analogy, but it's really worth reminding people how quickly the culture can change and how quickly a product like tobacco, which was normalized and advertised by doctors smoking in commercials, you know, within our uh, uh, lifetimes and, and our memory, very quickly became socially unacceptable, legally unacceptable, and the companies that profited off it, while they covered up the science and lied to people, were held liable. And, and now cigarettes cost 20 bucks a pack or whatever, and there are still people who smoke, but mm -hmm. the, cha the change in society has been dramatic in just a couple of decades. And that's the kind of flip that we need around fossil fuels, where it becomes really weird to see someone filling up their car. Because yeah. we have all pulled together and changed the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And this is like, I think this is something that can really help illuminate that path. Mm -hmm. Asbestos is another great example. I mean, people example. are sometimes like, like oh, tobacco, but you can't compare oil and gas to tobacco. Tobacco was a product that didn't have any social utility. Asbestos had great social utility. Uh, and that didn't stop them from being liable. And it didn't stop us from transforming society um, to... Uh, together uh, away from that. So uh, there are certainly other examples out there that, that make that point. So, and I think what, you know, this is a good place to end partly because of time as well, but this, that really what I hear and what you're describing is, and, and Subi Goyle is a part of it, it's not all of it, but this, this recognition that there is a culture shift that needs to happen it's not, a, it's not these small individual actions, although those can also be important and we should be taking those, but that there's a deep cultural shift that needs to happen and that this campaign is one approach to supporting that culture shift. 
And with that, I, I want to thank each of you for the intelligence and wisdom that you've shared today. I think, you know, this is going to be an ongoing conversation. And I'm sure you and I will have lots of feedback on this webinar and this topic. As I said at the beginning, it's definitely a controversial one, but an important discussion to, to have and to continue to have around all the things that you've talked about in terms of the cultural discourse and the ways in which we are or are not addressing what is this, this unfathomable in some ways crisis that we are currently in. So thank you all. Thanks everyone for joining us in this webinar and we'll see you again in the next one.